this is chapter one, part three, and after discussing the sociological perspective slash I slash imagination in part one and theory and our three primary theoretical frameworks in part two, for parts three and four, we are going to be focusing on research methodology. And so for these parts, how much of this might be familiar to you probably has a lot to do with whether or not you have taken any other lab sciences in the past um, because part of what makes sociology a science is that we follow uh, the scientific method uh, in a lot of ways which is very similar to maybe other sciences that you are more familiar with but to get this started we're going to start off by just considering you know how do we know what we think we know um, so you know people often say that they know things they know this to be true about society or they know this to be true about certain types of people or certain behaviors and so taking a step back and considering how do we know what we think we know now part of this has to do with you know we know things um, because we are aware of patterns um, patterns of behavior that occur in society tell us certain things if we see something often enough if we notice a particular relationship we will start to believe that this uh, pattern that we are notice is indicative of a larger pattern um, and perhaps it is something that is occurring even when we are not around to notice it um, but this idea that we know something kind of based on our observations and personal experience um, it does not necessarily meet uh, the gold star standard of engaging in systematic research. And so uh, research methodology um, is really what sets, uh, you know, sociology up as a specific social science and a discipline and not just that armchair like philosophizing and theorizing uh, that comp suggested that, you know, the everyday ordinary um, person uh, on the street engages in. And so that that gold star standard um, that systematic research has over other ways of knowing things whether that other way of knowing something is through like logical deduction you know where you figure something out based on uh, you know context or other things you know reliance on others where you know something because someone told it to you um, personal experience observation which relates to what I just said about you know you notice specific patterns uh, that that occur um, in society uh, that you notice in your you know, daily experiences and then mystical revelation is the final way of knowing something um, although that way of knowing something has kind of fallen out of favor in modern society you know people don't say you know God speaks to me or you know I learned this in a dream or from the ancestors it's worth noting that uh, in other human societies and past human societies um, this way of knowing something was seen as being quite valid um, but in today's world you know we we consider uh, systematic research as being kind of the best way to know something and there are several reasons why we consider this one of which is because it helps us control our personal biases you know if you just rely on your own experience on your own observations as we discussed when we discussed social location um, you know what you see what you notice what you observe and your interpretations of what you observe can all be kind of colored uh, by your own kind of personal experience um, and so systematic research allows us to kind of push past that um, as number two uh, notes um, you know it's not just that it controls for our biases but you know we as individuals are not you know omniscient and omnipresent we could only see and notice and observe and experience so much we don't have the ability to see all observe all and experience everything um, and so our uh, experiences and observations in addition to being to being potentially biased are definitely kind of limited in scope and breadth um, and systematic research allows us to be a little bit less limited and then finally systematic research um, when done correctly allows us to check up on each other because we're all kind of following uh, the same ordering of steps 
um, in the research model and we're kind of all operating under, you know, the same kind of uh, standards, uh, it allows people to go in and replicate and repeat uh, methodologies in order to determine is this thing that this person determined uh, in their research study, did I reach that same conclusion? Because if I did, it increases the likelihood that this is really true and that this uh, social phenomena is really happening and really occurring. Um, and so for all these reasons, you know, we consider uh, systematic research as being the best way to know something. And that was what Auguste Comte was thinking when he coined the term sociology and thought about, you know, what does it mean to have sociology as a scientific uh discipline um, because he was like you know sociology builds upon that armchair philosophy um, by emphasizing positivism uh, which is a concept from your book and this is just the idea that something can be understood um, and and scientifically verified right the idea that there is a truth out there that something is answerable um, and you can get at that answer um, and so you know it, it was it was basically Comp's idea that we would take these observations about the social world and then try to figure out which of them are are true um, and it is that uh, reliance on positivism that makes sociology a a type of science uh, science is just a body of knowledge obtained by methods based on systematic research and we often split science into two different types of science uh, social science which studies the social world things that relate to humans and constructed by humans um, and the natural science of course which relates to the natural world natural sciences being things like astronomy biology chemistry, chemistry, geology, physics, uh, uh, the idea that these sciences, um, this scientific phenomena would exist even if human beings did not. Um, and social sciences, as I've indicated, are the sciences that relate specifically to uh, human, human behavior, human history, um, human experience. Um, and that would be anthropology, economics, um, history, political science, psychology, and sociology. Um, and how do we uh, gain this body of knowledge? Um, as indicated, it is through systematic research and specifically our systematic research takes the form, you know, of the scientific method. And the scientific method is just a process of gathering empirical um, data, uh, creating theories and then rigorously testing those theories. So in part two of, of, of the videos, we discussed, you know, what theory is, right, that it is this kind of explanation about how the world works, um, something that is, uh, you know, an idea that can be uh, tested and potentially falsifiable, um, but it is, it, it, it is through this scientific method process um, that we test our theories, that we gather data. And in sociology, theory and research, uh, you know, work together. And so this is what um, our research model, our form of the scientific method looks like. Uh, there are eight steps um, and we are going to be going up uh, in this part, we're going to be going over the first four, and in part four of the videos, uh, I'll be discussing the uh, final four, steps five through eight. Um, and so, beginning with that first step of selecting a topic, um, you select a topic, and, and, the, and the great thing about sociology is that such a broad range of topics is applicable. Uh, if it relates to human behavior, human experience, um, really anything dealing with human society, it is probably an appropriate topic from sociology. Um, and after you select that topic, you then do what we call defining the problem. Um, 
another way of thinking of this and the way that I often discuss it more so than defining a problem is I, I discuss it in, in terms of developing a research question. And when it comes to developing a research question, the way to think about this is there are different types of questions, empirical, aesthetic, moral, and interpretation. And of those types, systematic research can answer empirical questions. Um, that, that is the type of question that is appropriate for systematic research. And so therefore, it's empirical questions that you should be developing. So let's think about what is an empirical question versus an aesthetic, a moral, and interpretation question. Well, an aesthetic question is a question in regards to taste. Um, you know, so if you're asking something like, you know, what is tastier, Thai food or Mexican food, um, or if you're asking, uh, you know, who is um, the better looking, you know, Sprouse uh, twin, Dylan Sprouse or Cole Sprouse, um, those are aesthetic questions because they are a matter of taste and people's taste vary. Um, there is not a, a capital T truth, uh, true answer out there. Um, and so for that reason, systematic research would not help you answer that question. Similarly, moral questions, which speaks to morality, what is morally right, what is morally wrong, is very similar because like taste, morality is specific to the individual. So you, systematic research can't really answer the question, you know, is abortion moral or immoral? Is capital punishment moral or immoral? because that's going to vary based on a person's kind of uh, beliefs around morality. And finally, interpretation, you know, asking someone what they think something means, um, you know, you show them a piece of artwork and say, what is the, what is, what is uh, the meaning behind this piece of art or this poem or this song lyric? People are going to have various interpretations. And once again, there is not necessarily going Going to be a capital T truth answer um, you know to that question and that's what empirical questions are they are questions that do have an answer um, that there is an answer a capital T truth that you can get to through systematic research now the good news is is all of those questions that I just gave as examples for aesthetics and moral and interpretation they can be tweaked and rewritten as empirical questions so you know take something like um the question about uh, Thai versus Mexican food. Saying which one is better, Thai or Mexican food, is an aesthetic question and not something that can be answered by systematic research. But if you instead word that question so that you ask, um, are there regional differences in what people prefer or what people say is better, Thai or Mexican food? That is an empirical question because you can ask that question to people all throughout the United States and see is there a regional difference in which one people say is tastier. Similarly, something like, you know, the moral question, is capital punishment moral or immoral? You might have a question like, um, does a person's gender impact the likelihood that they say that capital punishment is immoral? Um, once again, that's a slightly different question, and it is an empirical question that can be answered because you can collect the data and see, is there a difference between um, men and women's responses? in regards to whether or not they think capital punishment is immoral. So when you are developing your question or defining the problem, you want to develop a question that is empirical in nature and therefore can be answered. Now, step three is you review the literature. Most of the time, you aren't going to be asking something that's 100% brand new um, that no one else has ever answered or asked. Um, so you, you know, go to the literature, you look at the academic journals, you do some research to see how have other people approached this question, who did they sample, and what responses did they get? Um, because you're making the argument that although your research is in somehow, you know, is somehow different from past research, at the same time, it is building upon um, a, a literature uh, framework, a background of previous literature. 
And this is where sometimes, you know, having a specific uh, theoretical framework can be helpful. Um, because if you are asking a question and you are approaching it from a, a conflict lens, then you probably are going to maybe turn to how other conflict theorists have asked and answered the question more so than functionalist, functionalist, uh, functionalist uh, theorists have answered the question. Which brings us to step four, you know, um, before you even start collecting your own data, because you have now researched your, your topic and question and you have learned how other people have approached your question and what their findings were, you are knowledgeable enough to formulate a hypothesis. Um, and so a hypothesis is a, a speculative statement about the relationship between two or more factors. Um, you know, it's an idea about the world and you derive it from theories and previous literature um, and then you are trying to prove or disprove that hypothesis um, against your own uh, empirically collected data. And so before we get into the components of a hypothesis, I just want to emphasize the fact that sociology does not always require this step in the scientific process. We don't always require a hypothesis and that's because in our discipline there are two types of research um, that we embrace. We embrace deductive research and inductive research. Deductive research is your eight-step research model. You know you begin with ideas, you formulate a hypothesis, you collect data, you prove or disprove your hypothesis. And that's why you see that the form of hypothesis step is a form of deductive research. Inductive research, um, instead of beginning with ideas, instead you gather your data first and then you develop ideas. And so because you're kind of working in this kind of different order, um, the hypothesis is now no longer necessary. Um, and so with inductive research, and we'll talk about this more when we get to... Um, our fourth, uh, our fourth video when we start talking about specific research designs, um, specifically for some forms of qualitative data when you're where you're going out in the field, um, and you know you're kind of collecting your data um, before you even necessarily uh, you know look at previous data, um, and and certainly you don't go into the field with with uh, preconceived notions or assumptions uh, about what you expect to find. Um, that's why if you are doing that type of data, you're, you're doing that type of research, you don't necessarily have to formulate a hypothesis. But let's say that you are engaging in deductive research, which means you do formulate a hypothesis. Well, what are the components of a hypothesis? Hypothesis um, are composed of variables, and variables are a concept um, that can take on two or more possible uh, values. Um, and so you can have qualitative variables, and these are non-numerical variables, so things that can't be reduced to numbers. And this would be things like race, um, sex, gender, um, you know, specific attitude, or um, a, a specific behavior. Um, and then you have quantitative variables. These are variables that are numerical or that can be, re you know, um, reduced to numbers. And so this would be things like income. Uh, this would be things like age. This would be like years of education. Um, you know, if if I was to say how many pets they, do you have, um, that is a quantitative uh, variable. If I said um, what type of pets do you have, then that is a qualitative variable. So a hypothesis is composed of variables um, and you know uh, what you are looking for uh, in your sample um, as you collect your data because you give your variable an operational definition, um, a definition of a variable uh, that is you define your variable in such a way that you can observe and measure it. And in your hypothesis, once you kind of determine, you know, what are the variables in your question and you define them, then you determine, you know, which one of these is the independent variable and which one of these is the dependent variable. Your independent variable is what influences the change 
in the dependent variable. So your independent variable is what you think influences the change in the dependent variable. And so sometimes this can be very clear and sometimes this is not very clear and it depends on how you word your hypothesis. So, you know, let's start with something that is, is a very clear independent dependent variable out of this list. And that's like sex and career goals. So you're saying, okay, a person being male or female, um, is uh, going to influence uh, the types of career goals that they say that they have, right? So that is, that's your hypothesis. I believe that someone's sex influences um, how, uh, what they want to accomplish in their, in their career. Um, so that is uh, your sex is the independent variable uh, and career goals is the dependent variable. Um, something like popularity and social class um, in this case it kind of depends on how you word it because it could be either way if you say um, I think that someone's social class whether or not they are poor working class middle class upper class influences how popular that they are um, then in that case, social class is the independent variable and popularity is the dependent variable. If you instead say, you know, I think um, how popular someone is uh, as a young person uh, influences the social class that they uh, achieve later in life as an adult, um, now because of how you've worded it and how you are verbalizing the relationship, um, your popularity as a child is now the independent variable and your social class as an adult is now the dependent variable um and so you know you just need to be very careful when you are reading a hypothesis or when you are writing your own that you are setting it up so that whichever factor whichever variable you think is influencing uh, the change in the dependent variable that you are phrasing it in such a way that it is clear that that is the independent variable and in some cases there are some uh, variables that are always pretty much the in independent variable when they're used um, things like age things like sex things like uh, race uh, and ethnicity um, if it is that type of variable, what we call an ascribed status, um, so a quality that you are born with, um, you know, obviously it's going to be the IV because it's it doesn't make sense if it's the DV. Um, if you say, I think a person's race uh, influences uh, their musical taste, um, then race is the IV, musical taste is the DV it doesn't work opposite you can't say I think someone's musical taste is what determines their race like that that isn't how race works in our society so race cannot be a DV in that particular uh, hypothesis now if you noticed I I've been using the word influences the change of versus saying the IV causes the DV and that's because there are additional qualities and criteria um, that uh, variables the relationship between variables must meet before we can use the word cause you know um, we can talk about uh, independent and, and dependent variables in the terminology of correlation um, but there are additional criteria that must be met uh, if you want to talk about uh, I independent and dependent variables in the terms of causation and your book does go over this to a, a certain extent and I'm happy to discuss this with you um, via email if you have further questions but for this class it is sufficient to just know um, that uh, an IV and a DV um, uh, is, is, is definitely speaking to a relationship based on correlation even if it doesn't meet the criteria of being causation. And that is it for part three of chapter one. And so we only have one more part for this chapter where we will pick up with step five of the research model.